Washington University, President Mark S. Wright. Thanks very much, Jake. It's really great to be here. Uh, I have to confess, I didn't know anything about the Alexander Hamilton Society here uh, until I was invited to come and make some brief introductory remarks. But uh, whenever I see students dressed in coats and ties, I think it's special. <laughs> and, uh, this is a very interesting organization to me, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here for this important aspect of the meeting. And I'd like to thank our uh, colleagues, our guests, for coming, Dr. Mankin and uh, Dr. Harold, uh, who will uh, just be the moderator, interviewer of our distinguished guest, Dr. Mankin. Uh, everybody knows the university here is committed to teaching, research, and service in every respect of those words. And an event like this is one that includes both teaching and I hope that uh, we're uh, precipitating new ideas and um, of course uh, we're providing uh, commitments to make the world a better place. Uh, this is, you know, kind of unusual in, in connection with what we're focusing on, at least from my perspective, I was just saying that um, the international and focus on STEM is very important. Uh, I'm a chemist by background, and uh, I've uh, been involved in work related to uh, converting sunlight to other forms of useful energy, namely hydrogen from water and uh, conversion of sunlight to electricity. And I've been thinking for many years about uh, many of the global challenges that we face. And uh, I'm very pleased to know that here at George Washington University, uh, there is a deep commitment to uh, discover new approaches to solving these global challenges. Global challenges, of course, include uh, climate change. We've been through and are in a pandemic of global consequence and um, we need to be mindful that there are other challenges, such as considering that all of the uh, land for agriculture seems to be fully deployed. How are we going to feed a growing population globally? So advances in agricultural sciences are going to be necessary. And um, the students certainly know that uh, I'm chronologically mature. Uh, and when you look at the developed countries of the world, many of the populations are aging. There will be more people who are categorized as elder in China than there are in total in the United States. So challenges of the aging of society in developed countries is going to be <coughs> extraordinarily important. And there are going to be uh, challenges uh, in other areas that doubtless will come to your mind and do come to mind. But one thing that I've learned basically as a chemist, is that when you think about the challenge of climate change, it stems from a simple chemical reaction. Burning fossil fuel creates 
carbon dioxide. And if it's a hydrocarbon, it is creating both water and carbon dioxide. And that simple chemical reaction is producing too much carbon dioxide. And uh, ironically, maybe uh, at least to a chemist, um, chemistry now has an opportunity to make a contribution to solving the problem of global warming. Uh, as you uh, well appreciate, the transportation sector, automobiles, trucks, are responsible for a huge fraction of carbon dioxide emission, certainly in the United States and around the world. We're moving to electrify transportation. You know, it's very interesting how innovative people have been in the last couple of decades developing batteries that will enable a person to drive for 300 miles with one charge. Now there's the challenge if you're on a long road trip, you may not want to wait for an hour to recharge your battery. So important uh, contributions will come from rapid recharging of batteries. But I'm proud to tell you that I've worked in electrochemistry. Batteries are electrochemical devices. And technological advances can contribute to more efficient, lower cost, renewable sources of energy and storage of electrical energy. But in order to implement and take advantage of these advances, I've also discovered that uh, people need to work together. And uh, in terms of international relationships, just think about uh, the beginning of the pandemic when there was basically a dog's breakfast of uh, rules and regulations as to where people could travel and land. And even today, we see uh, difficulty in terms of having consistent requirements in connection with travel. Do you need uh, a PCR test four days in advance, the day of travel? Do you need it at all? Should you do an antigen test? These are things that require uh, collaboration, and uh, we do not have uniformity. But when we see global challenge like climate change, we appreciate no matter how brilliant a chemist could be, and I'm not the most brilliant chemist, but we know that it's going to require important uh, individuals who are willing to work across international lines. And uh, no single inst institution, uh, no university, and uh, not even a single country as strong as the United States would be and how important uh, a country like India, which will be comfortably the largest population uh, in the years to come. No single entity can solve these problems alone. So we're going to need international cooperation. And I believe, uh, as a scientist, that we can make important contributions to solving many of the problems of the future. And uh, chemists have a special role. I just completed a study for the National Academies as chair of what they call a consensus study, uh, evaluating the role of chemical research in the US economy. 
And in addition to the 500,000 people who work in the chemical industry, chemistry enables a lot of what is kind of taken for granted as technology. Semiconductor electronics have advanced dramatically. These devices that we all depend on uh, stem from important chemistry. And uh, when you add all of the enabling technologies or enabling uh, chemistry that supports these advances in technology, uh, it is said that chemistry is roughly 20% of the entire U.S. economy, something like $5 trillion. So I'm confident that uh, we can make additional contributions, but working to implement important solutions for the future is going to require international cooperation. And that's why I'm so excited that we're in a building which houses the Elliott School of International Affairs. I was very pleased to learn about this school uh, when I was selected to become president, and I've been very well rewarded by having the opportunity to interact uh, with individuals who are working in the school and contributing to global understanding and cooperation. I appreciate very much uh, the faculty who have been involved, but uh, what is most impressive, impressive about this uh, society is the student leadership. And I really appreciate uh, the students who've been involved. And um, I have had uh, the very good experience of welcoming all of the new students, both graduate and professional, as well as the undergraduates this fall. And I've had many opportunities over my now nearly 10 months of interacting with continuing students. And the people here really care about the future. And uh, I'm very appreciative of how accomplished you are and uh, what great ambassadors uh, you will be as you complete your studies here. But thank you for having me, and uh, I'll turn it back to Jake for uh, continuing our program. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Reagan. And so now it's time to boot up GWeb, change that major to chemistry, and go get your piece of that $5 trillion con. <laughs> yeah. Now, thank you very much. It's time to introduce our guest tonight, and it is my honor to do so. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thomas Mankin. Dr. Mankin is currently the CEO of the Center for Strategic Budgetary Assessments, an independent, nonpartisan think tank specializing in U.S. defense policy. In addition, he is a senior research professor at Johns Hopkins SICE. Dr. Mencken has an extraordinary record of public service. He currently serves as a member of the congressionally mandated 2022 National Defense Strategy Commission and as a member of the Army Science Board. Just to name a portion of his past positions, he has served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning, where he helped craft the 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review and the 2008 National Defense Strategy. And in 2018, he served as a member of the National Defense Strategy Commission. Dr. Mankin served on the staff of the 2014 National Defense Panel, the 2010 Quadrennial Re Defense Review Independent Panel, the Commission on the Intelligence Capabilities of the United States regarding weapons of mass destruction, and the Gulf War Air Power Survey. Dr. Mankin served for 24 years as an officer in the U.S. Navy Re Reserve, including tours in Iraq and Kosovo. He is currently, he is incredibly accomplished, and for a full bio, please visit our website. Moderating the discussion tonight is E.J. Harold, the Executive Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Mr. Harold served for six and a half years as the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for, for Defense Investment in NATO, following five years with IBM in Brussels and a full career in the U.S. Army as an artillery officer and foreign area officer for Europe, retiring as a colonel. 
He has been decorated for his contributions by the German, Italian, and Ukrainian governments. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests tonight. Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us for uh, a Friday night uh, event uh, before you head off to uh, uh, the weekend, and lots of fun, I hope. Uh, you'll note that I've put my, uh, my phone on the desk here. That's because I'm not wearing my, my iWatch. <laughs> my iWatch died this afternoon oh, yeah. because I'm a digital immigrant, not a digital native like many of you in the audience, and I forgot to charge it. So uh, I will be referring to it, but only for time to keep us uh, going tonight. Uh, tonight's discussion is about technology and its uh, impact on the future of warfare. And so we're going to jump right in with the fact that earlier this week, the national security strategy of the United States was published by the Biden administration. Now, if you've read it, it's only about 48 pages long, and it's, uh, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty simple prose. Uh, it very clearly states that we have ended the post-Cold War period and we are moving into a state of persistent conflict around the world. So tonight we're going to talk to Dr. Mankin about what that means and how if we look at what's going on currently in Ukraine, that may or may not be a, a predictor of what things might look like in another theater of potential war, the Indo-Pacific. So with that, Dr. Mankin, what was your first impression of the, uh, of the national security strategy, and did, did you find any real surprises in it? Uh, well, my first impression was it was about time. Uh, meaning, I mean, look, and I, I have uh, a lot of sympathy with the Biden administration, uh, uh, given world events, but you know, normally a national security strategy is something that comes out earlier in an administration. Um, oftentimes it doesn't, but, but um, Look, I think it's, it, it is symptomatic of the times that we're living, we're living in, right? The Biden administration came into office uh, wanting to, I think, earnestly focus on the challenge posed by China and focus on uh, Asia and the Pacific. Right? That, was, that, was, that was clear, that was clear from, uh, from the beginning. It was clear from the interim national security guidance that, that uh, President Biden issued. But then I would say the world intervened. Right, uh, and more specifically, the Russian government intervened in, in Ukraine. Um, but that was, and so I think the, the Biden administration has had to not exactly, you know, go back to, to um, square one, but has had to learn. I think what other administrations have also had to learn in their own way, which is that the United States is not just a regional power or a super regional power, um, whatever that region is, right, and so. Uh, in, in fact, the United States is a global power, and we need to think about our interests globally. Uh, we also need to think about our, our, our defense strategy globally as well. And um, again, I, I think this is something that, that previous administrations, uh, both Democratic and Republican, have, have, have faced. But this was yet one more reminder of that, that we need uh, a national security strategy that is truly global. And we also need a military that is that is capable of operating globally and operating across multiple theaters. Well, you, you right. just mentioned the, uh, the the scope and limitations of the national security strategy. And for those who aren't aware, there will be a follow-on national defense strategy that will uh, decant uh, the uh, the security strategy for the military uh, side of the house. Uh, but looking at what's going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukraine is kind of a mix of future and past. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many cases, they're using 20th century uh, equipment, uh, but in 21st century ways. Yeah. And we're seeing the use of new technologies on the battlefield that haven't yet been tried out in other theaters. And the, there are a lot of theorists, pundits, uh, reporters, who are looking at these uh, events and trying to predict the future, trying to tell us that this means that uh, the tank is obsolete, or this means that uh, there will be no safe space on the battlefield. Yeah. What do you think are, are some of the early lessons that are safe to draw, solely looking at the Ukraine theater, and then yeah. we'll talk about other sure. other potential theaters as the, as the follow-on. Yeah, look, I think, um 
So I'll, I'll actually start real at the at the real general because I think y Ukraine tells us a lot about the the challenge of. I'm going to say the military profession. And when I mean the military profession, I don't mean just limited to uh, men and women who wear the nation's uniform, but those who are interested in military affairs. And, uh, but I, I call it a profession because it is a profession, but it is, uh, I, I would say, actually to, to uh, President Wrighton's uh, very gracious introduction, I mean, it is a profession very different than uh, scientific professions. It is a profession very different than the profession of law, uh, the profession of medicine, and, and what sets the military profession apart from those other professions is that experience is only periodic and there's only so much we can learn from it. So imagine, and this, this might get a little bit icky, it's not meant to be, but you know, imagine a, imagine a surgeon, imagine a medical professional, Imagine a surgeon who studies her profession intently. She reads all the professional literature. She uses uh, all the most modern technology. She uses VR technology to practice operations. And yet she only goes into the operating theater once a decade. And uh, to make it worse, um, she, unlike most surgeons these days, uh, she, every time she uh, conducts an operation, like every decade, it's a different, it's a different operation. And to make it slightly ickier, sorry, but also to make it more, you know, uh, realistic, um, when it comes to mili the military profession, when she's operating on the patient, the patient isn't anesthetized. The patient's actually alive, and alive, awake, and reacting to everything that she does. That, in a nutshell, is the is the challenge that the that those of us who are interested in military affairs um, face. We don't have. We don't. Fortunately, right? Wars don't go on all the time. Every war is different. And so we have to learn. We have to learn from uh, history. We've got to learn from theory. And then we've got to learn from experience. And hopefully that's the experience of others before our own, I mean, just to be very, very blunt about it. So I think with, you know, with Ukraine, uh, there's, there's you know, so many lessons. Um, I think some uh, pertain to the enduring features. Right, so, uh, I, and here I'll, this is a, a unabashed uh, um, advertisement, right? I, I'm really interested in strategic studies, I'm really interested in strategic theory, uh, maybe more than a lot of my students, but, but I'm interested, in, and, but the value of strategic theory is you can, you can, there's value in it, right? I mean, that, that there's certain things that, uh, that apply across the years, across the decades, across the, the centuries. And, and so I think in, in some of the lessons of Ukraine are just, you know, reinforcement of, uh, of some of the verities of war. The fact that morale matters a great deal. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, even a country like Russia relative to, uh, to Ukraine, there's only so much military force that Russia brings to bear. Uh, and, and particularly when, when uh, uh, the Ukrainians, uh, I think, are, are justifiably energized, that matters a lot. Then, you know, there are, there are lessons uh, that are to say about about kind of new new technologies, new capabilities, um, and there's certainly that. And I think we should be looking at uh, the war in Ukraine. We should be studying the war in Ukraine with an eye towards things that can tell us about about other wars. So I was um, um, in a uh, in a converse. I'll just put it this way: uh, uh, um, respecting confidences. I was in a I was in a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago talking about modern information technology on the battlefield. And this individual was, was just sort of laying out a whole list of all the challenges that, that say the US military, other militaries face uh, on the mo modern battlefield. So, you know, yeah, well, we have to be able to communicate, we have to move and we, and, and boy, it was sort of a woe is me type of a approach to it. And my response was, well, yeah, but you, you've, you've laid out a whole bunch of problems. Well, at least to a f first order, the Ukrainians seem to have solved a bunch of those problems. And, and, um, and so we should be studying that, not because it's necessarily you know, the answer, but it's an answer. And we should, we, should be, we should be studying it. And then finally, I think the war tells us some things about, um, about cycles of history, right? So um, we lived through a period, or some of us lived through a period where uh, 
the United States had a, uh, a kind of a unilateral advantage in a whole bunch of capabilities. So there's uh, precision weapons, or pre I'll say just precision strike. And when I say precision strike, I mean not just the weapons, but I mean the sensors and the command and control capabilities needed to strike with precision. And uh, while it lasted, that was a good period for the United States. Um, but that period's gone, uh, and the precision weaponry has spread widely. And what we're really seeing today is the first major state-on-state -state war where both sides have lots of precision weaponry. And again, I mean that uh, um, broadly construed. And what do we see? You know, we don't see quick campaigns. We don't see quick, decisive uh, victories. We see uh, a protracted, attritional campaign. And I think the future is likely, all other things being equal, which they never are, but all the other things being equal, that we're likely to see more of that in the future. And so we need to ask ourselves, how well prepared or how poorly prepared are we for, for that type of world? And I think, I think for the United States, it's very much a mixed, mixed record. Well, let me follow up on that. You, you talk about the increase in precision weaponry and the, uh, the advent of modern technologies being used in a, uh, in a, in a major conflict. And so there's certainly a, a, a concern or a belief that expensive weaponry is going to proliferate, it's going to be used in quantity, and it's going to change the nature of warfare. But others are saying those expensive systems will be piecemealed out because right. it's too expensive to expend them all at once, and you can't afford to replace them, yeah. and you can't afford to be without them. Sure. So how are we to view the, the future of warfare under that scenario, you've just described the the uh, the successful use by both sides of precision weaponry, but what does it mean for the ability to carry on a protracted campaign sure. using those technologies? So, so uh, let me let me talk about the cost element of it because I think there's it's a it's a fantastic question. There's there's different kind of different elements of it. Um, why are things expensive? I would say, in general, things there, <laughs> things are expensive uh, uh, either because of inherent qualities of the, I'll just say, a weapon, right? Uh, or they're uh, they're expensive because uh, of the way countries go about acquiring them, right? So, uh, um, in the, uh, it's just a, okay, again, it's a ge general general principle, right? The uh, the longer range let's just say a weapon uh, that you have, the more expensive it's, it's, it's gonna be. Just because it costs money to propel mass through the atmosphere. And if you're propelling it five miles, it costs less than 10 miles, 10 miles costs less than 50, 50 costs less than 500 and so forth. So that's you know, some things, if you're, if you're gonna strike it longer range, and also, this can also be applied to aircraft, right? So uh, longer range aircraft are gonna cost more. Uh, ships with greater endurance are just going to cost more. Uh, all of the things being equal. Um, and so if you're going to strike at longer range, that's just going to cost more. But then also, yeah, things cost uh, as much as they do because of the way that um, countries, militaries acquire those capabilities. So early, I would say early precision guided munitions, and even going back to like the 1950s, 1960s, were very expensive. Um, today, particularly with the advent of coordinate-seeking weapons. That's a tremendously inelegant, but actually really accurate way of thinking about a whole class of precision-guided weapons. Um, talk about like, other people will say satellite-guided weapons, but they're not actually guided by satellites. That's not how it works. That's not how GPS works. Uh, the weapons uh, seek coordinates. They seek, uh, 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 it's not, their satellites aren't actually got doing any guidance at all. They're just passively, uh, telling you know, telling the the weapons where they are. The weapons are figuring out where they are and where they want to go. So coordinate seeking weapons are also are are compared to previous generations of precision weapons are less expensive. But even then, I think that the point is a very good one. That that what we see is that that um, Russia made limited investments in in precision weaponry. Ukraine has gotten limited. Uh, um, limited stocks of, I'll say, precision guided weaponry. So there's other ways of making up precision. Um, I think what we are seeing now is, uh, you know, so there's, there's ways of making up precision through targeting, right? And the, I think the Ukrainians are doing that. And that, 
you know, you can you can you can strike precisely uh, up to a given range, even if your if your weapon itself isn't isn't precise. But then also what we're seeing, and this goes with the the, the character of modern war, is as as, as you put it, I'll I'll just paraphrase it: the demodernization of of militaries. Right, so you got the uh, you know the, the the Russians pulling out you know their their T62s out of mothballs because of the the, uh, the more modern generations of tanks aren't, haven't been faring too well. I don't think the T62s will fare very well either. Um, so that's not the first choice, but that's also something we should be thinking about in terms of the U.S. defense industrial base. Um, we have for a long time, well, since really the end of the Cold War, focused on just-in-time logistics. We focused on uh, efficiency in defense production. And I think in the world that we're in now, we're going to have to focus much more on effectiveness. And effectiveness can sometimes come at the expense of efficiency, sometimes costs more. But oftentimes, it's, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. That's a great question. Well, the, the effectiveness uh, becomes a redundancy or a, uh, a, a building up of excess capacity in case of need. Yep. And uh, so a, a very interesting uh, thread there that we've just covered. I, I'd like to touch on one of the aspects of modern warfare that has not been well developed in theory, mm -hmm. but is being developed in practice, which is sort of the opposite way that we, we traditionally do things. Mm -hmm. And that's about uh, cyber, the use of cyberspace, mm -hmm. uh, particularly offensive cyber attack and the dog that hasn't appeared to bark yeah. in this conflict. The Russians were expected to be using massive cyber attacks to prepare the battlefield to soften the enemy target before waltzing into victory parades in Kiev. Yeah. And instead, there's been less evidence than we would have <laughs> expected, although not a, a, a total absence mm -hmm. of evidence. Can you talk about the experience of cyber uh, employment in this conflict versus the theories that we had expected to see here. Yeah. Uh, again, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great topic. And first, I'd, I'd go back to this, the, the, this challenge that I laid out, like the challenge of the, of, of the, of the military profession, right? So let's, let's think about that. Um, how to, right, absent, let's say, absent uh, the war in Ukraine, how to think about the role of, of, of the cyber dimension in warfare. Um, how are we supposed to do that? Um, well, what do people do? They argue by analogies, right? So for a, a long time, there was, you know, uh, are, we, uh, are we headed to a cyber Pearl Harbor? Or, or, or should we think about cyber weapons like, like nuclear weapons? And first, I would just say, you know, all analogies are, are, are imperfect. Uh, and I would focus on the fact that um, for cyber, you know, it's, it's, it's just how, how do you simulate in peacetime what could go on in wartime? I think when I think of cyber, I think a lot. Uh, the, the analogy I think about is those theorists, those practitioners who tried to think about aviation, strategic employment of aviation in the 1920s and 1930s, started to think through strategic bombing. All they could do was really reason and theorize, right? Again, just to be kind of blunt about it, you weren't going to take a bunch of uh, a bunch of bombers and uh, bomb Paris and f just okay. Let's run the natural experiment and see how it works, right? Um, or you know, uh, but, so you had to reason it through, and so you had theorists like uh, Billy Mitchell, like Julio Duhay, who tried to think that through. And you kind of go back and look at the way they thought through the problem. They got some things right. They got some things wrong. I think, as was then, as is now. So with cyber, uh, I think. Well, as actually, as with strategic bombing, there may be less there than meets the eye. I, uh, but uh, I think I think it's going to be some time actually to figure out what's actually behind what we're seeing in Ukraine. And my my suspicion is it's a number of things. Um, first, uh, I think you know may, maybe there are things that the Russians could have done that they chose not to do. Second, I, I, uh, I think it's assuredly true that there are a whole bunch of things that the Ukrainians did to mitigate the effectiveness of the things that the, uh, that the Russians tried to do. And, and that's why, that's why it's, I think it's really important to study contemporary wars, because I think it's only over time, and frankly, when you get a, uh, only when you get access to both sides, I think here we have kind of selective access to what's going on, that you can really, you can really figure these things out. 
uh, I'm, uh, uh, cyber has been playing a role, uh, hasn't been playing a decisive role, and to me, that's intuitively that intuitively makes sense, right? So if if you're if you're go I always say you know relative to what I mean if you're thinking about trying to disable your adversary's military forces, cyber has some um, benefits uh, as an adjunct to other means of doing so. But if you're if you're already at war, well maybe just lobbing you know lobbing a missile at your adversary is the the better way to do it. Now in peacetime. Right? If you're trying to influence, if you're trying to do things like that, then maybe cyber is, is uh, superior to other means. I think we have to think about things um, uh, like that in relative terms. And then the final thing I would say, and this is, uh, um, this is one of the, uh, another one of the dogs that didn't bark, is I actually think that the, you know, what one element of, of the Russian cyber strategy was their, was their narrative. You know, was the narrative that they put forward aimed at their own population, aimed at the West, aimed at Ukraine. And there I think we also should give ourselves a little bit of credit because I actually do think that releasing lots of information uh, in the run-up, really in the months leading up to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, had an impact. It, it, didn't, it didn't deter Vladimir Putin from taking military action. I think we can have a really interesting discussion whether deterrence in, was possible um, but it did really beat down the Russian narrative. So I'd say there the value of releasing information can be uh, measured uh, in terms of things we're not talking about, right? We're, we're, I don't think, maybe at, maybe at GW it's different, but at least at size we're, we're not talking about uh, uh, Ukrainian neo-Nazis, we're not talking about Ukrainian provocations before February 24th into Russia, right? That went away. And that went away through the release of a lot of information. And again, it really beat down the, the Russian cyber narrative. But, and the final thing I would say, and it goes back to the, uh, uh, the organization that, that, uh, that you used to serve, a, a, a final value of, of that release of information by the United States and others was to I think, help NATO, uh, a military alliance not known for quick action, uh, help NATO act, I mean, positively, Speedily, sprightly, right? Uh, and I, so I think we should give ourselves some 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 credit for that. Super. Well, so we've we've touched on the the Ukrainian theater uh, quite uh, quite a bit. So let's let's pivot to the Indo-Pacific. The lessons that we're learning from the Ukrainian uh, uh, war with uh, Russia are somewhat applicable, mm -hmm. not applicable or entirely applicable to the uh, Indo-Pacific region mm -hmm. and the actors that we find there. Certainly China, right. also North Korea. There's, there's a lot of posturing, there's a lot of action that's going on, mm -hmm. provocation, challenges. How do you see the ability of the West, that, and that includes the democracies of the Indo-Pacific, to apply the lessons being learned in the Ukrainian theater to what might happen or is happening in the Indo-Pacific region. Yeah. So the, uh, the easy answer is that uh, you know all the lessons are partially applicable, but that's also uh, that's easy and unhelpful at the same time, right? Because uh, well, in what ways are they applicable, and which way, uh, what ways aren't they? And right, that's the real challenge, right? What are the particular features of the war in Ukraine, and then what are the more general ones? And and I think you're right. There are lessons for the West. I'll just say for the United States. I'll actually just simplify it. Um, uh, just for the, to, you know, uh, uh, for the sake of time. There are also lessons for, say, Taiwan, and there are also the lessons that the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese leadership are, are drawing as well. And those may all be very different lessons, right? So I think for us, I mean, I'll, I'll just start with one. I mean, I think uh, for us, we certainly should be um, focusing a lot on the need to prepare for the possibility of a, of a protracted war. And that includes uh, our defense industrial base, that includes what we buy, includes how we buy. Our munition stockpiles, for example, uh, although the, you know, the, the exact figures are, are not publicly available, uh, uh, General Milley, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and others have pointed out that we, we've drawn down our stocks quite a lot. So we need to be not just building those stocks back up, but we also need to be developing a more, a more robust munitions industrial base. That's just one one uh, one lesson for us. 
you know, if, if I was on Taiwan, um, I would actually draw a fair amount of comfort from the ability of the Ukrainians to resist Russian aggression. And I would be asking, if I was, if I was uh, in President Tsai's government, I would be asking, what can Taiwan do to enhance its ability to, uh, to resist coercion? Because there's some, there's some cases where uh, there are some stark differences, right? So, so just to, to um, and those differences cut different ways. Uh, so, you know, so today the Ukrainian Air Force is still flying. Well, um, that's in part because uh, Ukraine has such depth and so many airfields. Not as much depth, not as many airfields as, say, Taiwan has. Okay, that's just a matter of geography. Uh, flip it around, um, the Taiwan is separated from uh, mainland China by the Taiwan Strait, and I think that is much less uh, uh, hospitable terrain than, say, the common border that Ukraine and Russia and the common uh, uh, border that Belarus and, and Ukraine share when it comes to logistically supporting operations. So I'd, I'd, draw, I'd draw comfort there. But I wouldn't draw too much comfort because then I'd, I'd switch to what are the lessons that the, uh, you know, that the PLA is likely uh, to draw. Now, some of them may be uh, lessons that we would find comforting. Again, the difficulty of invasion. The, uh, the attritional nature of, of modern warfare. I, I, th uh, I trust that the PLA is drawing some lessons like that. But they're also probably drawing some lessons that uh, aren't so comforting, right? So the Russians abjectly failed in their initial objective of decapitating the Ukrainian government. Um, if I was the Chinese military, I wouldn't just all of a sudden throw up my hands and say it's an impossible task. It's a fool's errand. I would, I would probably double down on it, right? And we should think about how different the war in Ukraine would be if uh, President Zelensky had been captured, killed, or forced to flee Ukraine, right? So uh, decapitating the, the Taiwanese government, I think, would be, uh, you know, would be a priority for, for China. Uh, similarly, if I was in Beijing, I might note uh, that uh, President Putin was in some ways slow to rattle the nuclear saber, let alone to kind of start to pull it out of its sheath. And if I was thinking about a future conflict with, with Taiwan, I would think about at least, uh, at least showing more of the blade of my, my saber early, early on. And then finally, my, my suspicion is that the Chinese are drawing lessons uh, in areas that we aren't even thinking about. So you know, one of the things that the, the, the PLA throughout its, uh, throughout its history has uh, emphasized is something that they call political work and the need to politically prepare soldiers for the task ahead of them, uh, to motivate them, to explain to them the, you know, the, the, the uh, justification for military action and so forth. If I was in Beijing and I was looking at Russia today and the Russian uh, Federation forces, I would see an abject failure to do political work. In other words, you go invade your neighbor, you invade fellow Slavs, you invade co-religionists, and you don't really tell the Russian soldier why they're there, why they're doing what, what they're doing. Uh, now, that might require a little bit of imagination to do it well, but if I was, if I was Chinese and I was, I was thinking about having to invade um, their, their neighbors, their relatives, their kin, that would be something that would be front and center. So, yeah. All right, I know I haven't covered all of the student questions that were provided, but I'd like to open to the floor and let you ask those questions directly. So if uh, somebody can pass the microphone to uh, our questioners, and we'll start with the gentleman up there who's got his hand up. So with the uh, expansion of... I'm sorry, could you identify yourself and what year you are? Yes, I'm Aiden Milne. I'm an international affairs major freshman. Um, so with the overlooming threat of cyber attacks, do you see militaries uh, go to maybe de-cyberfy their own militaries mm -hmm. or more reinforce their cybersecurity? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, Aiden. I mean, I think the, um, and like uh, many great questions, the answer depends, right? <laughs> so um, I, I think, so it gets, again, it gets back to this period that we're in when it comes to cyber, it comes to networking. 
Um, there are uh, all sorts of people, different organizations are placing different bets, right? They're placing bets on the ro robustness of, of, of networks and, uh, and dependence on networks. And I think it's, it's hard to have a one size fits all answer to your question. I think in, um, in some cases, it makes sense to have a, a, a backup capability to, again, to just to detach and be able to operate, uh, uh, I will say autonomously, and I mean that kind of, you can imagine that actually as autonomous systems, or you just mean you're, you're operating on your own. In other cases, uh, it may make sense to, to remain connected um, and, to, and to kind of, uh, uh, depend on the robustness of your connections to uh, to save you, right? So um, let, let's just think about it in in um, in the context of precision navigation and timing. PNT precision, right? So so everybody is the beneficiary of PNT these days, right? So your 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 iPhone has a GPS uh, chip built into it, and you're you're able to figure out where you are because of because of that, and uh, but also, but at the same time, the, the, the signal from the GPS satellites is actually pretty weak, right? So like go, go down into a subterranean uh, garage and try, try getting a GPS fix, you can't do it. Or uh, say if you're in Southeast Asia, you go under a triple canopy jungle, jungle you can't get it that way either. Um, so does that mean we should move away from GPS because it's, because it's, it's vulnerable? Uh, or does it mean we should have a backup or does it mean it depends? And I think in a lot of cases it, it, it depends. Um, and I think as in, in the case there, it's also the case with other, with other networks. Um, yeah. And, and just to add to that, the, uh, the experience of military units around the world is you train for the things that you have, and then you train for what happens if you don't. Yeah. So very, very frequently on exercises, units will be told, turn off your radio or turn off your GPS, now what? Yeah. And you have to figure out what, what is the analog way of doing things, you know, actually reading a map instead of looking at a GPS screen. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that go into what military units do to be resilient and to, be, to remain capable. Other questions? Okay, we'll go here, please. Uh, my name is William, uh, and actually I'm not a student here, but I work for the uh, Marathon Initiative. And I wanted to ask, um, how do you see logistics working when they're going to be contested with uh, uh -huh. precision guided munitions? Sure. So that's uh, that's a that's a challenge that we haven't worried about in in a while, uh, but it's uh, it's a it's a challenge we're going to have to start worrying about again. Um, and so I think it gets back to this this um, distinction I drew earlier between efficiency and effectiveness, right? So it, we have been living in a world of just-in-time logistics. Um, I think we all have, right? Not just the US military, but we all have, right? So uh, we've all been living in a world of uh, Amazon, Amazon Prime, uh, DoorDash, uh, whatever, whatever manifestation. That's all just-in-time logistics. Um, uh, what we've also seen over the past couple of years, though, is the problems with that, right? And whether it's supply chain problems or just delivery problems, right? I don't know about you, but my Amazon deliveries are a lot less reliable now than they were 12 months ago, 24 months ago, right? So we need, and that's, you know, and that's, that's, not, that's not even with an active adversary trying to interfere. That's just natural friction in supply chains. So we need, to, we need to be much more robust. We need to be thinking about, and that means probably more, you know, not thinking just in time, but also more stockpiling. It also probably means more stockpiling, um, not just in the United States, but say uh, uh, thinking about a, a conflict in the Western Pacific, more stockpiling forward. And that's an area where our allies can help us a lot. So uh, we've talked about uh, munitions, for example, well, I mean, one of our closest allies in the world, one of our closest allies in the, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region, Australia, a couple of years ago, uh, started their own, what they call their sovereign guided weapons and explosives, uh, explosive ordnance enterprise. And it really is an effort for, Aust uh, for Australia to build up 
its infrastructure uh, in the munitions area. And that's, a, that's something that we are talking to our Australian allies about, should be talking and working very closely uh, for, mutual, for mutual benefit because um, it's probably a lot easier to uh, say bring munitions from Australia to wherever the scene is then all the way across the, uh, the, the Pacific. So we should also be talking to our Japanese allies, South Korean allies, and others in that area. It was a great question. And in addition, the, the, the traditional concepts that we saw even in the Gulf War were depots with large concentrations of resupply material that then gets moved forward in convoys or in, in, in vulnerable fashions that are in, in a modern battlefield expected to be under attack. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of dispersal and multiple uh, vectors for achieving resupply and changing doctrine for how you do uh, logistics in general is all under study today and being, uh, being considered. Uh, let me go to this side of the room. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Ekaterina. I'm a senior student at political, uh, I said political science, otherwise known as unemployment. Um, <laughs> I felt all the Elliot kids laughing. <laughs> um, I wanted to show this. I'm currently holding this app called DIA. So if you're a Ukrainian citizen or a resident, you can receive an app that contains all sorts of information my military number, my ID card, ev everything. And in fact, I, I thought it was crazy, but in fact, I do remember reading that a few American states will also be rolling this out. Just a month before the war broke out, uh, millions of Ukrainians, I wonder if this is working? It's, it it's is, working. Yeah, it's, it's working, working. Yeah. fine. Mil I don't care. Yeah. Uh, millions of Ukrainians have had their data leaked. And right. as far as our government has said, they presume that it was the Russians who leaked this right. data. So someone in Russia knows my military number, I guess. Right. Um, as countries become increasingly digitalized, mm -hmm. both offensive and defensive digital capabilities will become important. And so my first question is, uh, do you think the United States is able to punch at its own weight when it comes to cyber security and cyber offense, cyber security and cyber, cyber mm -hmm. offense? Or do you think that there's a long way to go, especially since in this post-pandemic world, uh, you know, a lot of states are thinking of, you know, well, why carry physical IDs when you can just have it on Apple Pay? And you sure. can have those things. And the second question is about mm -hmm. Russian strategy, mm -hmm. in case maybe you know. Russia is just as obsessed as Ukraine is when it comes to IT. It's no longer a thing where you're a guy in your mom's basement and you just like computers. Sure. Uh, there are academies in Ukraine and in Russia that teach you how to hack into things as early as when you're six years old. Why did Russia choose to, or maybe they attempted, to completely cripple Ukraine's yeah. digital capabilities at the start of the war? And I don't mean just like Dia or something like that, but right. in general. And are you aware of what's going on in this field as pertaining to not just Russia and Ukraine, but Russia and uh, the West? Because sure. I know that there's constant hacking is going yeah. on between the two regions. Thank you. So uh, great questions. Uh, taking the second one first. Uh, again, I, I think there's a lot more that we'll know over time. But it, you know, look, uh, when it comes to uh, Russian malicious activity against Ukraine, right, it didn't really didn't start on February 24th, it been going on for, for, for quite some time. And so I think uh, in a number of cases, the Ukrainians did some pretty smart things, both in terms of, uh, of the previous uh, question, decoupling some, some uh, vulnerable networks, but also in terms of cyber defense. Uh, again, I think the contours of that will only become apparent over, over time. Um, but that's, and I think that's, that's, a, that's gonna be a, kind of a, uh, a constant, right? As you say, there's a lot of that that goes on on a daily basis uh, uh, in the United States with US Cyber Command, for example, uh, doing all sorts of defensive actions, and Homeland Security, and even, like frankly, US industry doing a lot of, uh, playing a lot of defense. That kind of takes me to your first question, which is um, when you say the United States, um, or, or any other country, right? I would, I, but I'll say particularly for the United States, I would differentiate between the U.S. government and I would say and U.S. industry. Mm -hmm. 
right? And, and I think uh, US industry is fantastic when it comes to cyber defense uh, uh, and cyber field. It's not alone there. There are a number of, of, of very impressive industries, countries with, with cyber industries all, all over the world, Israel being, uh, being just another example of it. Um, then, then the question is how perfectly or imperfectly, it's imperfectly, uh, does the United States tap into that, that expertise, right? But you know, if you think about the United States as a country, and I think in, in a lot of ways that's the best way to really think about it, uh, I think we do punch at our weight or ab uh, above our weight, right? And that's not just the, the bigs, right? That's not just the Microsofts. It's also the, bi the bigs when it comes to cyber uh, and, uh, and cyber defense. And they do a lot, uh, sometimes in the, in the spotlight, a lot of times in the shadows. And then it's even the, you know, it's that, it's that bit broader ecosystem of, of organizations, companies, uh, backed by individuals that we don't even really know. They aren't even household names yet, but they're doing some pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And I just say, you know, so um, uh, one of the interesting things about the organization I had is we are uh, on uh, the radar of a number of countries that aren't too friendly to the United States, so I have a lot of experience with, with cyber defense. We, we, uh, we, we play it, and uh, we get help from all sorts of, uh, uh, of companies. Again, some, some with uh, uh, household names, a lot of others that you probably would have no reason to know, but their, their skills are actually really, really quite good. Um, but we also have to live in a world where information does get out there, and we're gonna have to live with that, because that's not a, that's not, uh, that's, that wasn't something that just occurred in the, in the cyber era, right? In the, when, I was, when I was in college, like, you know, in the last millennium, uh, you know, somebody uh, stole a credit card application out of my student mailbox and got a credit card in my name. And I didn't even find out about it, you know, until like years later until there was a credit check. Right? So that wasn't cyber, that wasn't hacking, but it was, it was malicious activity. It was the old fashioned kind. So we still have to deal with that as well. But if I may reiterate, sure. in that case, why do you think that the Russians, who they proudly have sure. hacking forces, where are these hacking forces? Why can I still donate money to to yeah. write my anime girl's name on a missile <laughs> and have that shoot, uh, you know, my wife's name on a missile and then have that shoot? Sure, Russian sure. Ah. You know, I think I think that's a big no, no. But that's I think that's one of these questions that I think we will only understand in time, right? Put you know, put put differently. Uh, have their uh, uh, their capabilities been overblown? Have they chosen not to employ those capabilities for various reasons? Have they tried to employ those capabilities but have been thwarted? Right. I think those are the three kind of generic uh, generic answers, and. Don't know. I mean, that's look. That is another challenge of s not just even studying an ongoing war, but even recent wars. Look, put it in a different perspective. We four years ago we finished the centennial of World War One. Guess what? There's still really interesting, uh, path-breaking work being done on World War One. So we should have our uh, our expectations of, of an ongoing war uh, modest, should I say? Thank you. But to your question. There's some really fascinating work that's been done by our organization. I'm not trying to advertise anything that cost you anything. It's completely free. On our website, iiss.org, our work on cyber power, where we've actually created the taxonomy to measure nation state cyber power and compare and contrast the abilities of nations around the world. We've done about 25 nations now. and uh, in including the Russians and the Chinese, and you, you'll find the reading compelling. It's interesting. A way of doing things. Folks, I'm really sorry. Uh, this has been so fascinating, but the time has flown by. Uh, so thank you for the questions. Thank you for your attention. Let's give an, a, a round of applause to Dr. Monka. <laughs> for coming out. Um, Dr. Macon mentioned Billy Mitchell when he was talking. You all might be familiar with Mitchell Hall. It's the same Mitchell. And as you leave, I want you to think about this. I want you to think that this is the place where those types of leaders come from. This is where people who thought about the future of warfare in the past came from. This is where the leaders of the future of international affairs came from. 
in the past and we're not stopping. There will be in the future a Phillips Hall, there will be a Falk Hall, there will be a Zhang Hall. And I know that the people in this room, the people I'm looking at, are going to be the folks to do that. So with that, I want to thank you all for participating in the inaugural 2022 AHS Conference. And